Okay, give it a minute, maybe less. I'm okay, <laughs> okay, guys, we are live. Yay. I awesome. am just going to do this quickly. Hey, welcome, open mic. Today is the 14th of June and we are at the kitchens today. Thank you so much, the youth of South Africa coming to the kitchen. Thank you so much, everyone. Welcome, everyone. Um, as you guys know, it is a global platform. So welcome to all the globe around there. Welcome so much for joining today's call. I appreciate your attendance. Um, yeah, and hoping to have some interactive conversations with everyone and Let's see how it goes today. So let's kick off. I think let's each of us introduce yourselves, who you are, and just welcome to Open Mic um, Foundation, guys. Simongele, let's go over to you. Introduce yourself first, guys. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Simongele. I'm 25 years old, and I am a social media manager. And I'm very excited to be here with the first you talk. Um, very humble. And yeah, a little bit about myself. Thank you. Jason? Hi guys, I'm Jason. I'm 23. I'm currently running my own business selling uh, vintage and thrifted clothing online through Instagram. You can see us on Redo Clothing Co. Uh, yeah, I studied honors at Vega. I did my undergrad at Tux. So yeah. Cool. Karen? Hi guys, I'm Karen and I'm currently studying towards an ECD qualification, and I run a mommy and parenting blog. It's Torrens Mama on Instagram and Facebook. Ria? Hey guys, uh, my name is Ria. I'm working for Viacom CBS South Africa, and um, I got my degree from Vega Strategic Brand Communication. And currently, I'm doing a certificate in digital branding. Um, I do marketing and digital marketing with Viacom CBS under the brand MTV and MTV Base. Awesome. Rudo? Hi, everyone. My name is Rudo. I am the junior account manager for a research company, and I just graduated honors. Oh, well done, guys. Thank you so much for joining. You guys are really awesome. So today's topic is about, you know, it's about the youth. What are some of the fears and challenges that you face today? Um, I also want people and whoever is looking at this video on YouTube or looking at it live being streamed on, on Facebook right now, for everyone to please note that it is the speaker's um, understanding, it's their viewpoint, it's what they are struggling with today. There's, there's no reflection on, on anything else that's going around, it's what they are currently experiencing. So this is their own story, right? what they're currently feeling emotionally, what are some of the challenges that they face, whether it's personally, whether it is, you know, um, work-wise, and it's their story that is being told. So I need everyone to understand that it's your viewpoint. All right, Simon Gela, you're going to kick us off today. Yes. Okay, so from our previous discussion about our personal fears and challenges, I started looking into it a little bit and I realized that yes I am very blessed to have a job and a steady paycheck you know I can pay the bills however the fear is that I'm afraid of actually losing my job and that is a real thing called job insecurity and it has a lot of psychological issues and especially now we look at it from a South African point of view and the unemployment rate, especially amongst the youth. And it actually has been forecasted that unemployment will be around 35.3% by December this, of this year. So the numbers keep growing because I think last year it was forecasted 23%. So that is a huge jump. So now in the state of like the economy and where everybody is. Now I'm thinking, what if I do lose my job? Because that means I won't be able to pay my bills. You know, um, I have car payments, I have insurance, I have retirement fund that I'm saving towards. So that only, it's not even the job loss 
it's the consequences of the job loss and the psychological burden it has attached to that. And I'm sure that people also like wanting to be an entrepreneur, start their own businesses, the risks associated to that, because yes, it's one thing to want to start your own business, but in an economy where it's pretty difficult for, well, in terms of demand and supply, although people are there and maybe money is coming in, they would rather save it because they are concerned about spending money during this time. So it's just a whole thing. I just went through a whole mental, I don't know, or whole, because I'm trying to understand, or I'm trying to kind of calm myself mm-hmm. and live in the moment, saying, yes, I do have a job, pretty grateful, don't get me wrong, but the factor is being dependent <laughs> on my parents again and um, not being independent anymore and the possibility of losing my car, losing my retirement funds is scary. What would you say, you know, if you if you have a look at, you know, the economy there has, the unemployment rate has definitely risen up, okay? Yeah. A lot of the companies, you know, have to, have to pivot their businesses into a very different way and outlook of working, of being established. So it's very different for companies and organizations today, right? You being currently employed and... In, and obviously you have a degree, you have studied, you have done whatever, you know, what would you say would be the hardest thing for you to do? Do you think it would, it would be hard for you to find something else? Let's, if for whatever reason, let's say you had to lose that job. That's the thing. When it, the psychological burden on the mm-hmm. job security thing is, it's not even about the future you know in terms of yes it is possible that I can easily get a new job and Mm -hmm. I Mm -hmm. do have job experience and I'm starting studying towards my master's so I'm Mm -hmm. qualified Mm -hmm. and I have job experience however that's not the problem the problem or the wall the barrier is the fact that you have it's more of an identity thing if Mm -hmm. I have to put it that way because once once you have money, you don't want to be broke. That's the gist of it. So once you are in a position where you're able to take care of yourself, you don't have yeah. to rely on other people, you are independent, mm-hmm. you start making mm-hmm. a way for yourself, mm-hmm. going backwards is yeah. not an option. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. the fact of the matter is, yes, I am confident in the fact that, yeah, I could probably, probably get a job. I could start up my own business. I could do something. But okay. the fear lies with being broke and being dependent on somebody else after you have realized or established yourself as mm-hmm. yeah. I, I do get I do get being broke, obviously. And I'm saying the word broke because you've used the word broke, right? I knew I do know the word broke. You don't want to go backwards. Yeah. But things do happen. It yeah. does happen. You know, if you have a look at today's economy, it really does happen. It does happen. What, you know, I mean, we have a lot of unemployment today in youth, right? Um, mm-hmm. what, would, what would you say would be some of the challenges of, of moving forward from that? You know, yes, I know you're scared, right? You, I know you yeah, are scared. Just, yeah. it's psychological, mm-hmm. it's a whole mindset trigger that's triggering you and you've got that fear instilled in you because you don't want to lose your job. And you still have to maintain what you're currently doing right now, though. Absolutely. So when I was doing the research, I also researched how to counter that. Okay. And because it is a psychological thing, there's obviously things that you have to work on, you know. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. So things from making sure you have a financial safety net, something that you will be comfortable with in terms of if you do lose your job, you will be able to pay off goals or whatever it may be maybe but also making sure you reduce your spending you you know change up your lifestyle a little bit so that's one um mm-hmm. the next mm-hmm. one is um actually realizing that you have anxieties 
attached to losing your job. So the first step yeah. is acceptance. Um, and then actually putting in or pretty much breaking down those barriers because that anxiety actually stifles creativity and productivity. So I can't claim to be afraid of losing my job and not do anything about it. For yeah. me to be able yeah. to do something about it is to be self-aware and make sure that I, I guess, break free from that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the best way to reduce that insecurity is to take action. So I remember, mm -hmm. so remem basically remembering why you were hired in the first place and what are the needs the company like needs <laughs> and basically mm -hmm. working towards achieving your goals in your uh, professional life and your, your daily tasks or whatever it may be. And asking your manager, is there anything else that I can do if maybe you feel stuck at work, maybe be provided or ask for more responsibilities. Basically be in a position where you feel like the company values you because of the work you are doing and contributing. Okay. So yeah, basically steps like that um, and also stay positive. You know, it is a mind game. So shift towards an optimistic, positive mentality and do your job. Make that money. Okay. You know? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Awesome, Simon. Okay. Thank you so much. Is that the only fear you have of losing your job? Okay. Well, it's one of them, but that's like the biggest one right now. And it's a current, um, a personal thing. Um, for me, okay, honestly, it's also, um, I don't know how to put it. It's health, right? And the, the reason why I'm saying this is because I've had a lot of health issues with people close to me. Mm -hmm. let, me let me not say health, but let me just say losing someone close to me. Let me just put it that way. Okay. So, it's a death. Base, yeah, death related yeah. okay so when it comes to people living their best lives you know mm -hmm. normally it it is scary because you find like a lot of people today a lot of the youth they may take that a little bit too far and I'm I'm never in a position of judging somebody else's life but my thing is when should I speak up when shouldn't I speak up is does it have anything to do with me am I you know, is it because of my judgments that I think of one thing, but it's maybe they're okay. But then something happens and then you have the guilt of, okay, well, when I should have said something and then you lose someone and then that's, you know, a terrible situation and result to the way yeah. that you live yeah. or they get really sick or, you know, it's just a lot of things, but losing someone really close to me that is hectic because it's like all the love and all the, the connections and the memories, everything, it just ties you so close to somebody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Losing them, it's like it, it affects you too. It's like just a punch in the gut. So, yeah. Yeah. So, what's your lesson on that? So, you clearly have lost people close to you, right? Now, you have learned something from that. So sometimes you don't have to say the right things. You don't have to say anything, but you should be able to give the love and the support that you need to someone without any judgment, right? Yep. And, so and must remember, we never know what happens in the next minute or the next second of anyone's life, right? And they always say, and, and it's a saying that I've heard, you know, while growing up is that appreciate the people that you have in your life. And when you appreciate the people that you have in your life, say what you need to say there and then with no regrets. That's true. And that's what I've been doing. But it's even gone beyond that. It's not even about people that are close to me. It's everybody. So I've started to, you know, I'm a very confident person and I'm very, you know, out there as a person. So when it yeah. comes to you know, getting in touch with people, getting to know people, I always make sure that I always put that friendly, loving, you know, face forward. So people know that they are heard and people know that they are loved because you never know what, what another person is going through. So that's yeah. what I've learned in terms of just running, well, 
running away from the what it will, the guilt, I guess, running away from the guilt and not saying anything, but, you know, just embrace it. And it is what it is. If you don't like what I say, I can always apologize and make things better. Yes. But if I just don't say what I want to say and then something happens, it's going to affect me more. So rather mm-hmm. just say it, but say it from a place of love, create stronger memories and just live in the moment and embrace the people. So there's a comment, there's a comment for you here, Simon Gele. Um, it's a friend of mine. Her name's Suzanne. Um, Suzanne, um, she's from Singapore. She says, Simon Gele, you have touched on all the elements most people are experiencing in this environment. I'm so proud of you, how you are developing yourself, though the turbulent time. You will shine even brighter with your resilience. <laughs> Thank you, Suzanne. That's so kind. <laughs> Can I comment on Sibongile's first fear? Yeah, sure. Go mm-hmm. for it. I think it's, it's definitely the consequences of this job and being broke. And it's also the thing of nowadays, it's not, it's not about if you have your honors, if you have your masters, it's really about who yeah. you know. And I think that's another thing, like if you don't know certain people and you don't know connections in the field you're in, then it can also be like you you might just not even get an opportunity regardless of how smart or how experienced you are you know what i mean i i heard a lot of things that nowadays it's not about your papers it's about who you know you know in in your specific field and i think i don't know if, if that can be an advantage or a disadvantage but one thing that us as the youth can do now is that when we're in our field we don't close off to like our company that, okay, I can only talk to these people because we're in the same industry. We need to go to conferences. We need to do networking sessions. We need to go to talks where you, you say, hey, I'm in research. Yeah. Hey, I'm in advertising. And start networking because, unfortunately, in the world we live in, your masters and your honors are not going to get you as far as they would have 10 years ago. You know what I mean? I agree. So I think that's what so we have here. it's so it's kind of it's kind of a balance it's kind of a balance right um i can tell you um there are certain people in different industries that i trust when i move from one organization to another organization i bring the people that i trust in um you are spot on what i've learned throughout my my career as well is networking is crucial it doesn't matter it doesn't matter the level of conference you go to. It doesn't matter if you uh, can add values to that conference. It's about what you learn from that conference. The people that you meet at the conference, the connections that you meet. What I have done is I've met people you know, across the globe, right? I'm still in contact with these people. And you do need to continue and continue and continue networking with people. You, you know, there's one thing I, I, I teach my friends. <laughs> I was teaching some friends of mine, right? You don't have to have 100% in common with, with anyone. The one smallest little thing that you have in common with is the one thing you grasp. Rudo, I met you. Remember, we, we were at a workshop. I we didn't at know Rudo. Board. We were doing a vision board. board. She and I, yeah. I didn't know her. I didn't know her from a bar of soap. I didn't know her at all. I didn't know who she was. I didn't know where she came from. I didn't know. But the one thing we clicked on that day, we ended up becoming friends afterwards. And she's my brand ambassador for Open Mic. Yes. Right? Yes. So it, you don't have to know somebody entire history. If you have that slight little connection with someone, you imagine the doors are going to open endless for you. So very great point. Absolutely. Okay. So we have losing the jobs and death in terms of fear of, of, of yeah. death and grief basically yeah. okay cool thank you so much Simon Gile. Jason over to you well yeah I mean similarly to Simon Gile, what she was saying for me it's more the case of choosing to go into my own business and the potential of that failing you know more so than you know losing my job I would think it's losing my business and what do I do from there because I've actually never been formally employed you know, for me, it's the fear of if I, if my business doesn't work out, 
for instance, if I spend five years on it and it doesn't work out, uh, what are the what do I do from there? Do I attempt to start another business? How do I get capital for that business? Do I need to then go and look for a job, wait another five years, gather the funds, then restart? You know, for me, that's that's the fear. The the, the, the thoughts of now, if I put all my energy and all my time into starting my own business, determined that it's going to work, what if it doesn't? You know, where do, I, where do I go from there? That would be for me at the moment. That's my biggest fear. So currently, Jason, you're an entrepreneur. I think give a little, um, a little bit of insights of people as to what do you currently do for, this, for them to understand because... You know, you're young, you're an entrepreneur, you have your own business. I think just elaborate a little bit for the viewers right now. Okay, so I, I sell vintage and thrifted clothing through Instagram at present. We're, oh, well, we're starting a website soon, but for the moment and for the past five years, it's been just through Instagram as the platform. And it's all, I mean, secondhand vintage thrifted clothing, and we sell it literally to customers, pay via EFT, etc. So very, very informal. But yeah, I mean, it began as a, a passion project when I was in first year. Mm -hmm. I was thrifting clothing for my own cupboard. And then I had friends saying, you know, where'd you get that? And I couldn't really tell them because it wasn't a retail shop. So I said, well, you know, I've got it through someone. And they said, well, would you let me buy it? And after a while, a lot of my friends were asking. So I thought, okay, this could actually be a bit of a business. So I just, I decided, okay, I'm just going to open an Instagram page purely because I didn't want to flood my personal Instagram with items of clothing for sale, you know? Mm -hmm. So I thought, okay, let me just open an Instagram. I'm familiar with the platform. And then it, you know, it kind of took off. I think in, it was on the 23rd of May, 2016. I think I released 23 items for sale and I sold them in the first seven days. And then I thought, okay, wait, this, this could work now. So then I just kept going. I just kept getting more items. And the next month I'd release another 20 or so. Then they would sell out. And then with that money, I'd go get more. And then, yeah, since it's just, it's become a thing. I mean, last night we had 2000 followers, which isn't a huge, it isn't a huge following, but yeah, but a, quite a milestone for, for me. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not, okay. it, I mean, at, at present we don't even, I don't, I mean, I'm not going to disclose how much profit we make in, or I make in a month, but it's not enough. It's not enough to sustain how I live at present anyway, you know, I'm still, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm getting money from my mother. I still have money saved. So it, it covers expenses, but it doesn't cover my full rent of my apartment, et cetera, et cetera, you know? So now th that's another fear. It's how do I take it to the next level where it can be something where I have employees, where it's formalized, where I register, like what is the tax implication of it? You know, mm -hmm. things like that. I definitely think it is a very unique business, a, a unique business that I myself have not heard of. I think it's definitely needed. Um, Suzanne's asking, Jason, what is the name of your Instagram handle? We have a, I, I just want you, you to know, right? We have a lot of absolutely empowering business women that's on this, um, on this group, right? They, some that's of them are not here, but they are, they will help they will they will help anyone that comes through their way and that's what's so lovable about open mic is that the people that's on the platform is will open up the doors and if they see you struggling if they see that you need help if there's any way that i that they can help that that's who they are um we have someone by the name of amina i mean oh amina hi amina amina says regarding jason what are your other skills um that you have to fall back on Okay, well, I have two degrees, obviously, undergrad and postgrad. I did BCom business management at Tux, and then I did mm -hmm. honors in brand management at Vega. So, yeah, so I mean, that's, okay. that's, what I have, that's what I have to fall back on in that sense. And I have, I've worked, I've done internships at different companies. I did an internship at Fila, South Africa last year. So, like, yeah. I, I, have, I have connections in that sense. But, like, okay. for me, it's a case of, what position would I want to fill if I were to apply for a job at any of those places? Yes. You know, for me, it, it's that. I, my ideal, if I were to work for someone, if I were to have yes. to claim a title, would be to become a brand manager. And I know that that's one in a million. You know, there's only so many brands to manage. But if I wasn't starting my own business, in 10, 15 years' time, I'd see myself as a brand manager, preferably of a clothing company. Okay. So, um, 
I mean, I hope that answers your question. Um, Suzanne from Singapore again says, Jason, you need to give her your Instagram handle, please. Okay. Please do that. Okay. Um, and it's and she says that it actually works in Singapore, and she's telling yes. you to keep on going. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm I'm one of one of 10, 20 pages, just like well, not just like me, but I mean, there's about twenty pages in South Africa that do exact or similar business model to me, selling secondhand vintage or thrifted clothing through Instagram. And I mean, there's a community of us, and some are closer than others. A lot of us work, you know, I wouldn't say we work together, but iron sharpens mm -hmm. iron, you know. So mm -hmm. we, we all we all kind of connected, and some of us are friends beyond the business. Some of us yes. become friends through the businesses. So yeah, I mean, there's, there's a couple of there's a couple of guys you know that speak about almost our informal market and how to regulate it. I mean, there's obviously there's the there's the opportunity for a lot of dishonesty in what we do. Mm -hmm. A lot of the mm -hmm. items they are flawed. I mean, some some things. Of course, you find something thrifted. For instance, I mean, I'm wearing something that's thrifted now, Polo Ralph mm -hmm. Lauren item that I know will retail for a couple of thousand rand, managed to get it thrifted. But in some instances, there are items that are flawed and people, you know, there's a lot of, of, there's a lot of room for dishonesty with what we do because you don't necessarily need to disclose those flaws. And if someone pays you for an item and you send it to them, you know, most guys have a strictly no returns, no refunds policy. So once you've paid that money, if it mm -hmm. arrives, it's got a stain or something and you didn't know, you know, there's a, in a lot of cases, there's nothing you can do, you know? So for me, that's been something that I've been working on hugely, being very upfront, very transparent with, if something has a broken zip or a little stain, et cetera, it doesn't mean it's worthless. It's just mm -hmm. important that you just close it, you know? So yeah. Agree. Yeah. Okay. So Claire, um, Claire has, a, has a question for you. Um, yeah. Jason, she says, you started your present business because you saw a gap in the market. Clearly yeah. you did, right? If you had to start something new, do you think you could find the gap again? Yeah. Okay. I, definitely think I mean, so. you do, if you have a look at what you've studied as well, it clearly helps in your business. No, absolutely. Branding, branding social, guys, all of you guys, branding, social media, advertising is the way to go. You guys know that, right? Yeah. You know, it's, it's a word of mouth. The, I'm not too sure from, from the research I have been conducting when I started Open Mic and a few things that I've been doing in the last year, year and a half or so, you know, the best or the cheapest way for marketing is word of mouth. Yeah. That just brings your traffic. That just brings the quality that you have, what you sell, whether it's your products or services, it's one word to another word because of the trust that or the relationship that you have with that person. And, and that's what sells. Um, you have a very unique business and, and to Suzanne's point, you know, don't stop. I think oh. there is a bigger market than, than what it is right now. No, absolutely. Uh, I also wanna, hey, absolutely. No, I mean, there's, there's here in terms of the formal side of it, there are huge gaps. There's a lot of people running Instagram stores, etc. but in terms mm -hmm. of taking it formal and making it, I mean, there's, the exact same business model formalized is very common in the US, for instance. You see it everywhere. There's guys making a full-time living from running a vintage shop or a thrift shop. You know, they have a brick yeah. and mortar location. They have employees. They get a paycheck every month, you know, and no one, well, there's a couple of places that have done it here, but no one's done it to the level that the US sees it. I mean, it's there. It's like, it's like running a clothing brand. You know, there are photo mm. shoots constantly, Website is always stopped. It's really, it's not, you know, it's not amateur hour. Mm. I really think people, you need to get out more. You, people need to hear what you are doing. Definitely, for sure. I think it can definitely grow into something really big and phenomenal to help a lot of people for that matter. And let's yeah. be honest, right? Not everybody has 500 rand to go and buy a t-shirt or even 300 rand to go and buy a t-shirt. I think no, the exactly. average price is what? 250 to 300 rand a t-shirt these days? Who yep. has that money? Okay. So, so, okay. So business capital, that's your fear. Anything else, Jason? Um, well, I mean, that, that's at the moment, that would be the primary fear. I think one fear that I dealt with during, during varsity. And I mean, just as I started my business was also related to Sibongiles, the fear of losing someone. I mean, I, I started my business in 2016 and in 2017, my father was diagnosed with cancer. So that, 
kind of, I mean, that was right in the start of my varsity career. So all through my varsity career, my dad did chemo. And I mean, my dad and I were best friends. He was my, I mean, he, he was the one that really wanted me to start the business. When I said to him, you know, a couple of my friends are saying they want to buy my clothes. And he said, why don't you mm-hmm. let them? And I said, no, well, I don't know. And he said, no, if they want to buy your clothes, let them buy the clothes, like make it happen, you know? So, I mean, with that, all through my varsity career, that was like the double life, you know, living, living here in Pretoria in my apartment and then going home to my dad, he's doing chemo, et cetera, he's sick. So it was, I mean, that I almost dealt with my whole varsity career. And then during honors, it, it reached a point where it was, it was totally unmanageable and the chemo wasn't working. So he stopped. And at the end of honors, my dad passed away. So, I mean, for me, that was, as I finished honors, it was the one thing that my dad really wanted to see me do, which he did. And for me, it was, it's difficult, you know, because you feel like he gave me so much direction and he was mm-hmm. my biggest supporter. And in terms of the business understanding of it, he was, he was just a wealth of knowledge. And then just as I thought, okay, well, let me start taking this very seriously now, buy a URL, start a website, let's like do this. He passes, you know, and I feel like for, and, and sub, subsequently, three of my friends, they lost their dads in the months following that. And all of us are, you know, 23, which in my opinion, it's young to lose your father. Of course, you can lose them when you're a kid. But this age, it's difficult because you're transitioning from being a kid, being reliant on people to being independent, you know, living in the real world, as they call it. And I think mm-hmm. you know, for a lot of people, and for me included, it's difficult to maintain direction and to not go off the rails as a result, you know. Okay. Okay, so losing, so between yourself and Simon Gale, losing somebody grief, definitely, for sure. I hear you. Yeah. So, again, Suzanne's come back, Jason. She says, there is a next Netflix show called Girl Boss that sells vintage yeah. clothing. Is so, yeah. I think you need to go and check that out, please. Okay, and, well, and, and give me and, and give me some feedback, okay? Because I think Suzanne's going to ask me whether Jason did this or not. Girl so, boss. Okay. it's called Girl Boss. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Apparently, cool. you'll be able to pick up a few things from there. I think, you know, to just customize it a little bit and, and to see, you know, what's, what's going on there. Awesome. So, grief. Yeah. So, we have losing your job. Um, fear of losing people and grief and then obviously death and then we have obviously the capital part in terms of being an entrepreneur from a business perspective you know what are some of those things and how do you maintain and grow that 100 percent yeah cool anything else jason any questions or comments for jason guys i have a comment Mm -hmm. uh jace when you were talking about the whole transparency and that's how you pretty much want the, the, basically the foundation of your, yep. your practice i think yep. that's pretty awesome please stick to exactly what you're doing because yep. simon gilly you just froze i was, I was gonna say i thought it was only me that thought <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah, she's gonna come back she's yeah, gonna come back know. just now okay all right. <laughs> it's okay. She's going to restart. Jace, thanks so much for that. Rudo? I have a question for Jace. Like, I think we all have such a fear of losing someone. And you are actually, that was a fear and it actually happened. Yeah. Are you, what are you doing to kind of keep sane and be like, okay, that fear happened. Like, what, what are you doing? Because I think some people who are watching this might be also, yeah. they may be going through hurts of losing somebody. So what are you doing? Are you... Well, I mean, well, I mean, the first thing I did was I immediate, immediately looked for therapy, obviously, because I think for me, we, after losing someone, it's one of your, it's one of the most important things, especially, you know, someone like your dad, your mom, someone that you're really close to. See, Bungile, are you back? I'm back. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I I've immediately, I mean, even prior to my dad passing, my mom was saying she thought we should seek therapy preemptively which I agreed with, but during honors, et cetera, it just, it was unsustainable. You know, it, it, I couldn't really do it, but immediately after my dad passed, first thing really was to find a therapist that I felt comfortable with, which I think, I think for a lot of guys, I mean, my friends now, I see them all males, they've lost their dads and none of them are looking for therapy. 
none of them are seeing a therapist, which I, I think that's like a big mistake. I understand that, uh, I mean, therapy is expensive and not everyone has the, the facilities to see a therapist, but even if it's once a month, I don't, you know, a, fa a family therapist, with maybe, you know, if you go with someone else in your family that's also been affected by the same thing, because I personally, that's been the only thing that made, that helped me make sense of everything, like during that time, you know, like immediately after. And then, yeah, just so, remembering whoever, whoever passed, you know, remembering them. I mean, my, my apartment, you can't see it, but I mean, it's all my dad's things, my dad's bookcase, it's all his books. I read his books. I watch the things we used to watch. You know, you have to, you know, find a way to keep, keep them alive despite them being gone, you know, and it, it, it hurts, but it's cathartic. You know, it, it feels nice to enjoy something that you used to enjoy with that person, feel the loss, feel the absence, but then, you know, it, it, yeah, it's quite cathartic. You know, they do say that memories is the most treasured possession one can have. Yep. Okay, and when you lose someone, I've lost my brother. I lost my brother, it's 10 years now. Um, and I can honestly truly tell you, the memories that you create with people that you love and that's in your life is the mm -hmm. thing that sticks. Materialistic things that you obtain while you are working is absolutely meaningless. It yeah. serves a purpose for you there and now, but that's about it. The memories, the 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 things that you create with the people and the and the moments that you share with people is the thing that lives on inside of you the most mm. um you know i i can tell you simon gale and jason it takes time they say time heals yeah it does yeah. it does it you know it i don't say heal i think the pain becomes less yeah losing someone is not easy it becomes just less painful um, I don't think time heals it. That's my view. That's I mean, re relating to that, I mean, when I first started going to therapy, I mean, the therapist, I was saying, you know, like it, it feels like it's, it's nonstop, it's constant, like it's, you know, you feel like you're being suffocated by grief, you know, and I yeah. said, I don't know right now how it feels. I don't know if it's ever going to feel different or go away, you know, and she said, no, it's more a case of in the beginning, it's just like the ocean, you know, it's wave after wave after wave after wave. And then as time goes on, the waves start to spread, you have more good yep. days, than bad days, and it yep. starts to spread out, you know, you have one meltdown a month, you have one sad day a month, then it's one every three months, then it's once a year, you know, yep. so it never goes away. But the, the, the regularity at which you're triggered, becomes yep. more spread. Yep. You know, so it feels more manageable because you have more good days than bad days. Yeah, absolutely. Totally agree. So I have Kimmy. Kimmy um, um, sends a, a, I think this is um, a, a, to all of you. She says, fear equals false evidence appearing real. Fear drives us into ambition. Failure is an illusion. Another door opens when something doesn't work. Fear creates more ambition and determination. Fear is some ways can be good. That's Listen, cool. I can truly relate. Thanks, Kimmy, for that. I do appreciate that. I, I can truly relate to that. Me, fear drives me to excel. Yeah. It, it, it's the opposite for me. It doesn't shut me down. It makes me want to achieve more and yeah. believe that I can conquer and move forward and stuff. So I think people have fears in, in different ways and facets and pockets and it's how they express it out to me. And not everyone's like that. But fear in some ways can be good. Cool. Thanks, Jason, so much. Karen. Thank you. Oh, before I started, I just wanted to say, I actually think with Jason and Sibongile, they touched on something that I don't think it's just us, the youth, but a lot of us, because of what we're going through right now in this time, we're all afraid of losing someone. It's not just, oh my gosh, I'm afraid of losing my parent, but I might lose my sister. Like there's this yeah. potentially life-threatening disease out there that affects all of us. And I think we're all afraid. Like, and last night it was my mom's birthday and I sat there crying and I'm like, I can't be with them. The borders are closed. I probably won't see them for another year. And the minute the phone rings, I'm like terrified. Like, is someone sick? What's going on? And I think that's a fear that all of us have, like right now, not just as the youth. Like, I think even the parents and the grandparents were all 
struggling to deal with this right now. Yeah, sure. Cool, Karen, over to you. Yeah, but I think other than that, my biggest challenge right now was having this little career change because prior to being mom and blogger and all, I was a human rights lawyer, like full on proper human rights, masters in international law. And it was just, it wasn't working for me. Like mentally, I wasn't into it. I was struggling and my mental health took such a toll. Like I was grumpy, I was miserable. I was getting up at 5 a.m. and I just, I couldn't figure out what to do. And like Sibongile said, I didn't want to quit and take two steps back because, hey, now I'm that girl. Like I can do girls nights, I can do coffee chats. And now I must be like, okay, I can't even afford the basics because I'm trying to find my happiness. And it took almost two years and my son being born and me looking at him and thinking, but do I want him to live his life according to this expectation? You know, because you get onto social media and everybody's doing the most and there are all these voices, do this, be this, do that. And it's so hard to find your voice and what makes you happy. So taking that leap to just be like, you know what, I'm going to leave this. And I, am ve- I'm, I'm, I admit that I'm very lucky that I come from a family that could support me in that and say, you know what, you want to do this. You can't handle this. Do that. We will support you wherever you need help financially. We'll give you that support. But it is a big leap. You know, I went from the girl who was always out there to now, sorry, I can't do coffee dates because I can't afford the 50 rand for a cappuccino tip and parking, you know, and uh-huh. you lose friends not because they were bad people but because I was afraid of admitting guys I'm really in a bad place you know like I can't afford this so I kept quiet and it comes off like oh but Karen doesn't want to be with us Karen doesn't want to be our friend like it's just so much just trying to find you in all this noise and now that I've done this and I mean I'm so much happier you know and it's just taken some time to realize that success is different you know for all of us and like how Jason said he's never been formally employed and I think that's commendable but for someone else that might be like but is that successful and I think that's great but it's just I think there's a lot coming at us right now of what we should be especially as young women because the world is open to us as women it is open you can be whatever you want and if I say you know what I really like being a mom like I like being a mom. I want to work with kids. Like, I don't really want this master's in international law. I want a qualification to work with children that are zero to three. That's what makes me happy. Like, the world looks at me like, really? You want to do that? You want to be down there instead of up here? And yeah. we've worked yeah. so hard. Like, as feminists, we did all of this. And you want to just throw it back in our faces kind of thing, you know? Okay, so I'm going to let you pause there for a bit, right? So are you saying society is dictating or society is judging what success is looking at? I I really feel that success is very monetary and how much money you have in your account, what your job title is, where you live, what car you drive. So now you live in a little modest house, you drive a little modest car, you're doing what makes you happy. You're not really successful. Yeah. Like, nobody cares. Like, it's like, oh, okay, do I really want to talk to you? Are you worth my time? It's like when you meet yeah. someone, the first question is, what do you do? And that <laughs> answer determines how much time they're giving you, you know? Like, if I tell you, hey, I'm a parenting blog, it's like, ah, thanks. Next, please. <laughs> <laughs> Why? This is, this is quite interesting, right? So this is fascinating for me. And I'm sure some of the people that's on this call and some of the people can see, you know, I think everybody gets judged. Everybody has that. There is a certain level of judgment that happens with people. Okay. Yeah. Society has definitely dictated how the judgment looks though. Okay. So here's a question to you. So I've learned this the hard way. So I'm going to (laughs) ask you this question, maybe to all of you, right? Do you care about what other people think about you? Nope. I, I actually, I would love to say no, but it's taken a long time to get there. Because okay. I think in my last blog post, I even wrote, I had this love affair with my GHD because I never saw myself reflected. And so now yeah. I had to have the straight hair because I wanted people to like me that way. Like, 
it takes a lot to be able to accept yourself and say, whatever, I don't care what anybody else has to say. Okay, so Simon Gillis said, hell no on her <laughs> end then. Um, <laughs> right, she said, hell no there. So Jason, you do, you, do you care about what other people think? No, not particularly. Yeah, I'm not that. I mean, now, okay. now with, with, with business, uh, of course, yeah. like, I, I, want, I want people to, in terms of thinking of me as someone that's trustworthy and someone that, you know, can be trusted to do business with someone that isn't going to squander money, that's fine. But in terms of how people see me as a, as a person, person. Yeah, yes. no, I don't No, I don't need people to like me, to be honest. You know, I don't mind. Okay. That. Okay. Rio, yourself? I, I, I really do care about how people see me. You know, um, really? I think Please I think it's me. easy. I think it's easy to be like I don't care, up until it's there in front of you, right? Um, for example, the way I speak, the only reason I speak this way is because I want to speak to everyone else. Otherwise, I could have spoken in a way closer to how my grandfather spoke or how my grandfather's father spoke. It doesn't mean that I, right? But it just means that if I speak to you guys now, you guys will take me more seriously because of how I pronounce my words. Um, you guys will take me more seriously because of how I dress. You guys will take me more seriously because of how I smile. And I think sometimes it goes to self-love. Sometimes it goes to self-care. But also I think sometimes we go over and above for other people to create a reality about ourselves that isn't true. And that's why I really yeah. do care. You know, like um, I've tried to create realities about myself that aren't true so that I could enter doors, so that I could have conversations. And once I entered that door, I worked to make that mm -hmm. reality. But while I was outside, I lied. Mm -hmm. And it's all because I cared about how you see me. So can I, you, you touched on something really real right now, right? And, and here's the thing. Do you not think that you, you're, you're not your authentic self when you try to make, make you seem as if you um, are someone else because you're trying to fit in? Whether it's the way that you speak, whether it's a typical conversation that you want to fit in, whether it's a social group or a particular crowd, you're kind of not being yourself. I think so. But also, I don't think everyone gets to know who I am. You know, that's not reserved for everyone. So I think okay, I, always, okay. I always refer to life as a game, you know, and maybe maybe it's narcissistic of me or maybe I think, you know, it's, it's small, but I really think life is a game. And I think when you play this game, there's some people that get to have Rhea, you know, the full version of Rhea, mm. where I'm dumb, I'm stupid, I'm childish, right? Um, and then there are other people who don't get to have this version of Rhea. There are other people who are going to have the more professional side of Rhea. That's not who I am, but I need to pay the bills. I need to pay the rent. And therefore, I come to wherever they need me to be at so that I can be that person. That is not me. I don't want to be that person, but I have to pay the bills. And I think it all goes to like what Karan was saying. You know, sometimes you're not happy where you are. Um, and if you have that pillow to fall on where you're going to have the support so that you can be who you are in its entirety, great. Mm -hmm. There are times where you have to just, you know what, uh, you bite the bullet and you keep going. And I think it's unfortunate that some people live like that. But I do think at the end of the day that that forces you to be a variation or version of yourself that is not true. We, we, I think, and you know, not to be disrespectful or step on anyone's toes, but no, I think no, no. I think we can act like we don't care. I think we mm -hmm. can say we don't care. But at the end of the day, guys, like we are part of a so we're part of a circle. We're part of a social setting. We're part of a community. And the only mm -hmm. reason we exist fully in those settings is because mm -hmm. we care about what other people think. Mm. Okay. I, I respect your viewpoint. I really do respect your viewpoint. Thank you for that. Ruda, I'm gonna before I say anything, go Ruda. <laughs> I wanted to like when you said do you care? To be honest, guys, there are certain areas of my life where I do definitely yeah. care what people say. But when I'm speaking, when I say I don't care what people say about me, I'm talking about things that, um, things, personal things. I don't care what you think about how I look. Why I look good is for me. I want to dress up for me. You must, I don't care about um, if, you, if you think I'm too petite with, with all these thick girls standing next to me things like that i don't care about but things about my um not even not even to say if i care about what they think it's more like hey what can i say like um i care i care about what my family maybe 
um, especially about maybe my development, my growth, my, my work, my choice of friends, not to say that they control that or that um, they would have a huge say about, hmm, why are you hanging out with this person? But I would care because I care about what they were, because I love them and I know that the best me. There's some friends that if they tell me something, I would care more about what they think of me than other than outsiders or other people. You know what I mean? Mm. For me, it's like if I love you and I trust you, I definitely care about what you're gonna say about me, especially to things mm. that matter to me. So yes, I care about okay. I care about what people say, and I and I, it's like a I'm not I'm not that's just me leave me alone because I know you want better for me, so I'm gonna listen yeah. to you and I care about what you say. That's why it's gonna matter to me. It just depends. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. okay. So I, I think what, you know, Karen's point was about society was looking into her and there was a certain level of judgment that was being made w- whether she didn't go for that cup of coffee with the friend because she couldn't afford it at that point in time. Before I say something, Karen, tell me, did you tell them what you were going through? You, do you not think those friends would understand? And that's the thing. I think at that point in time, I said nothing because I still wanted ah. to have this exterior. And it's it's a lot to have to open yourself up and say, hey, this is what's going on. And mm-hmm. it's like this whole process of marriage and parenting and all has taught me that we need to speak more because I was not speaking about a lot of things. And I was keeping yeah. quiet. And the minute I opened my mouth and I was like, guys, I'm struggling. I was like, you're also struggling with this, but on the outside, you look so cool, calm and collected, you know? But then I'm also the person that has struggled for a long time with myself and my self image, you know, like my sister always sees like her memory of me when we were teenagers getting dressed. I would be so angry with how I looked and I didn't like it. And I'd like have a brush and I'd be like, why, why, why are you so ugly, Karen? I was that person, you know, <laughs> like, and it okay. seems so stupid now, but like back then I'd look around, I'm like, oh, so I need to look like this. I need to do this. I need to have that. And yeah. it's yeah. really hard to make that transition yeah. to now, okay, yeah. I need to be an adult and I need to love myself and accept myself regardless of what's going on, you know, like looks, success, it's all so intertwined and it's hard to separate it. They say when you start accepting yourself, you become more happy. Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) that is so true. So true. So before I I wrap up that conversation, Simogere wanted to say something. She had a hand. I actually want to touch on a couple of points. Um, (laughs) (laughs) She made a list. (laughs) No, it's just, I just want to clarify something. It's like, yes, I do respect what people have to say about certain things, but at the end of the day, I don't care how they perceive my choices. So as a person doing my own thing in life and as a person living my own life and as a person that has accepted myself for who I am, um, I know that if I let other people dictate what, what they have to say about my life, I know that's going to emotionally break me down. And with my last talk, I did share my experience about how I've learned how to love myself and stuff. And that was from a very young age. And I was also raised in a way where it's like, don't worry, don't care about what other people think. So I already had the mentality of it's me, it's about me. So my achievements in school, outside of school, how I am, how I speak, how I do my hair, that is all because of my choices and what I've chose you know how to love and just because people assume or think you this type of person because you speak a certain way yes I am well spoken that's because I took the time to educate myself the way I wanted to to embrace how I was raised as well so yes I can speak this is Zulu I can speak to Soto yes I can however I can also speak English but that doesn't make me any like um you know, like less black or less, you know, professional, just because I speak the way I speak. I have, I am the person I am today because I worked very hard. Like I was, I'm a, I'm a very focused person. I'm a very confident person, but I will never take 
I will never re regret anything that I've ever done in my entire life because somebody else thinks I should be a certain way. And even in my company, I feel like they know exactly that. But let's, that's a conversation for another day. <laughs> but I have made it a, a, a point that in any situation I step into, I need to know exactly who I am. So we're not confused, okay? So if I'm, if I'm outspoken and I offend you, I'm always the first person to apologize and to make you understand that it is not you, it is me. When I speak, I speak because it's, it's me. It's what I want to say. It's my opinion. But it is never right just because it's right. And it's never wrong just because you say it's wrong. So that's just how I think of life. And Ria, when you were speaking, to be honest, I was like, dang, that's, that's a little bit sad because I remember you as the type of guy who was like goofy and you're funny, you know, and you're cool. <laughs> and then you're like, you know, people. And I'm just like, oh, people are the worst. But you're not that guy. You're like a cool guy. <laughs> and keep being you, dude. If I remember correctly, I need you to be the same you I met you as. That's all I got to say. That's a whole lot she just said right there. Yeah. Go off. So, so I, you know, I, just to close off what society looks at when you look at people, right? I'm a total extrovert, total extrovert. You cannot get a more direct person than I am. Yeah. To be honest, I don't give a shit what people think about me. So Jack, we Amen. I don't, not at all. And and I think because of the challenges I faced and the fears that I faced as I was growing up made me realize when somebody looks at me, I respect what you think of me. It's your opinion. It's what you see. It's what you believe. But it doesn't define or make me who I am. And that for me, that for me is a level of respect I would have for anybody. So if somebody comes to me today and tell me, oh, you know what? You're so full of yourself. Sure. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yeah. I do. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Right? Somebody tell me, you know what? You need to stop saying what you're saying. I'm like, okay. Um, thank you, but I'm going to continue because I can. Exactly. It's my voice. It's yeah. me. It's my authentic self. I've been there, done that. Sorry. I'm not going to change to, to suit a situation or to be someone else that I'm not. You know, when you, when you understand who you are and you, you flow through a lot of fears and challenges through your life, you don't become somebody you're not. You become and you reflect somebody of who you are. So for me, I respect everyone's opinion, everybody's perspective, but I say with the kindness of heart, it is yours. It is your perception, it is your assumption, it is your yeah. viewpoint. If you feel that you need me to answer, you need to respect my opinion and my, uh, and my perspective of where I come from. But it doesn't define me. Society should never define. And, and to be honest, I think a lot of women, Karen, I think you've touched on it, is that women define themselves by what people say they are, what people yeah. view them to be. How, how you see each other, whether it's this, whether it's that. I mean, it's a whole lot of crap, man. It's a whole lot of crap. Really, it is. If you, look at, if you look at women out there and how they've overcome some of these things, they don't care about what people think. They, they acknowledge they acknowledge what people think. They, they hear what people think. They listen to what people think. But they don't validate it. Mm. There's a difference. Yes, <laughs> Rudo. <laughs> I, I, I will stand by I, you shouldn't care and I don't care about what, what people think about on the outside or, or um, my behavior or something like that because the thing about society is that even those perfect girls, really not that perfect they, they are put in front of the camera and, and, and changed and edited and, and there's so many things that we don't even see but society will be like mm, if you have a six pack you're hot if you do this, you're, you're the it thing. If you drive this, your status is... So things like that, those are the things that you shouldn't care about. You know what I mean? So just touching on Sesha's point, like, absolutely. 
things like that. And this, the thing is, society continues to change. We can even use a small thing by, by the shape of your eyebrows. It was first thick. Yeah. Yes. And then it was slim. Then it was like a straight yeah. line. You will continue to just will never find yourself. Never. That's one thing. That's something that you shouldn't care what people think about, you know? It will forever change. Yeah, no sure. <laughs> Karen, we totally took your topic. <laughs> and we went that, that's the thing. Like, we really need to stop and realize that what we see out there is the highlight reel. And that, for me, yeah. was the biggest lesson that it's not everyone's life. It is the highlight reel. And I'm not going to post, like, when I have an argument or I'm having a shitty day, I'm not going to post that online. You're going to see, hey, this is a vegan-friendly kitty recipe. I'm not going to tell you that actually my kid had Vienna's and cheese for like, supper because he wasn't feeling it. You know? like, I'm going to tell you what I think you want to see. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, wow. Wow. Okay, Karen. Is there anything else, Karen? No, I think that's it. <laughs> awesome. Thanks so much for Karen. Um, Rudo, Kimi says, hello, beautiful Rudo. Hi, Kimi. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Ria, over to you. Um, hi, guys. So I think for me, I have a couple of fears, right? Um, but I think at the top of all of them is uh, competence, you know? I think, competence? Yeah, competence. Okay. I, I have the fear of not being competent enough. I think all my life I've always been told that you're going to be doing it wrong or you won't make it far or this is as far as you go or this is the end. When I was young, actually, um, I used to see a psychologist who told me that, you know, my brain development would probably go as far as like grade seven. And then after that, it's downhill from there, right? Because I don't know, I have some condition. I didn't take it seriously. And I think that's why I'm here today. But mm -hmm. I yeah, have some condition where I can't see further or I can't see as far as anyone else, you know? And I think that haunted me for a long time and so haunts me now. And it's a fear of mine because the space that I'm in isn't um, one plus one equals two, you know? It's, mm -hmm. it's you, have to, you have to be innovative now. Um, you have to bring change and you have to bring change. That Those are my KPIs. And not meeting those KPIs for me is scary. And it's, it's, it's not scary because I might lose my job. It's not scary because I might not have a job tomorrow. It's scary because I actually enjoy doing what I do. And I'm so afraid that tomorrow I'm gonna to be second, I'm gonna be second best. I'm so afraid that tomorrow somebody else is gonna do something better than me that I could have thought of or that I could have taken more time to think about and do better than them. And I know again mm -hmm. it's so narcissistic of me, but I just I wanna be one of the best in my field. And that haunts me every day because when I go to work, I'm an intern, mm -hmm. you know? And when I go to work, I, I'm, I'm always trying to push the bar. And there are times where I push the bar and they're like, yo, dude, that idea is actually not good enough. We've thought about it and it failed. And that to me is a dagger to the heart, you know, because it's like, okay, it's, it, it's great to know that the idea didn't work, but the dagger comes from somebody thought about it before me. And it's just those little things that, yeah, it's, it's weird. I know it's weird, but mm. those things that like, really make me scared because I really want to push the envelope. I really want to make change. Um, I come from a space where in my family, it's doctors, it's accountants, it's lawyers, mm -hmm. guys, no one did a BA. When I did a BA, I was told that this is a stupid degree. You know, when mm -hmm. I graduated, no one cared. And, you know, it's just that whole thing. Of, I need to be competent enough in this space and I need to be I'm game changing enough in this space so that my nephew, so that my niece, so that whoever knows that this can be done, but this can also be done well. Because even if you look in our industry, even if you look in our space, um, it's championed by the people who own the companies. It's not championed by the people who work in the companies, as opposed to if you had like a lawyer, a lawyer is championed in the company, you know? So these are just the things that I hear about. And these are the little things that I really, really, really want to bring to the table and bring change around. That's, that, that's at least my biggest fear. I don't know if I should trickle down to my other fears or... So, so we, we can go into the other ones, right? It sounds as if it's not a competency thing. It's more about a failure thing. Fully. So, I, so I'm, I may not be... I think you're competent in what you do. 
in how you do it. But I think what it sounds like is that you you fear of failure in what you do. I, I don't know. Eh? Like I, I think. Have you I, ever failed? Have you ever failed? I, I failed so much, and that's the thing. That's why I, I don't know if it's failure per se. I welcome failure. Yes. You know, I think you know I've had so many conversations with my mates where they did well and they passed, and I failed, and we go back to the same conversation, and it's like, what's one plus one? Yo, dude, I did that three years ago. Off the back because I, I know it's too, you know. And that's why I appreciate failure so much. That's why I welcome failure. But again, that's why I, maybe I'm wording it wrong, but I honestly welcome failure. I just, I'm afraid of not knowing. I'm afraid of not being good enough when I need to be good enough. I, perhaps it's failure. I don't know. But honestly, I do welcome failure. Okay. So, so when you fail, I'm just asking. So when you fail at something, right, what do you do with that? What's the feeling and emotions and, and what happens when you fail? Let's say you got, you got a task that you had to do and you had to create something and you failed at it. You got a feedback at saying that, you know what, you failed at it. I needed, so, I needed something else and I didn't need this. What, what would be your response to that? Um, so I think in a professional setting, right? If yeah, professional setting, yes. comes to me and she's like, yo, dude, you didn't meet the standard. Immediately yeah. I was you know, you know, I don't just take you didn't immediately. I'm like, where did I go wrong? Mm -hmm. And once you walk me through where I went wrong, you know, I appreciate it. I go back, I do it right, whether you need it or not. If mm -hmm. Maria, you did this wrong, so therefore we can move forward. I do it again anyway. But the reason why I do it again is because I need to know I can do it tomorrow. So if you come to me tomorrow with the same problem, I'm not going to give you the same execution I gave you before. I'm going to give you a better execution. I understood what what I did wrong. I understood where I go, what, where, how I go right. But mm -hmm, mm -hmm. when you also in the space that we, we believe in going over customer expectations, and I think it doesn't only go to customer expectation, it goes to client expectation, it goes to manager expectations. I believe in going over and above that because once I give you that, you see value in me. I don't know, I can't remember who really mentioned the whole thing around value, but value is so important because again, um, I think sometimes we, 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 we put value in things like knowledge and education. Whereas sometimes it's just being able to make clients happy all the time. They'll come back and perhaps you don't give them the best resolve. You don't give them the best solution, but because you treat them better than anyone else, they're more mm -hmm. they likely to go through your nonsense um, up until you get a right answer than to go to someone else who was a douche and speaking down to them the whole time as if they're not the one. So I think I'm rambling. No, 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 no. Um, okay, what are, what are the other fears that came to you? So, sorry, Jason had something there. No, yeah, I, I just got, so you were saying initially that your fear is competence. I think it, it's less, it's less as much a fear of being incompetent as much as it's a fear of not being exceptional. Because that's what it sounds like to me. It's like, and you say, you speak about people seeing value in you when you exceed the expectations and particularly in your industry where you say that, the for instance the company is champion not the people within the company you know for you it's a case of because you're not being championed for instance if, if you execute something beautifully or you know exceptionally the the company takes almost they they take that idea as it's theirs it's not you in particular i think it, it relates more to your almost like a fear that you aren't so exceptional that you actually are the value provider within the bigger scheme of things. If that's like what it sounds like to me. I think Jason, like I hear you, but again, like, I think like when I was a child, right. I wanted me to be seen. Right. Yeah. But now that I'm much older, dude, I honestly don't care if I change the world and no one says Rhea changed the world as long as the world has changed. So I really want to, it's me, me giving the value doesn't mean you should come back to me later and be like, Ria, you know what? That was amazing. But I think me giving the value, I need to know for myself, I did that, right? Yes. Um, in, the, in, 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 in my team, I need to know, I need them to know that uh, for us to have the same type of execution we had today, we'll need Ria. But outside of setting, let's say, for example, you get the chocolate, right? There's milk, there's sugar, this whatever when you eat that chocolate i don't care how you whatever happens you, you don't have to know uh, you got that chocolate for me i just need you to enjoy it so ria 
we have Amina. Amina is a business coach, a business and intuitive coach, right? And she says regarding, um, she says your confidence was lost when you were growing up. She says, find your niche. This may be unconventional. You may surprise yourself. You have the inner strength and abilities to succeed. Don't try and prove others wrong. Rather show that you're capable for whatever that's worth, okay? So I think, you know, in, in some instances, you know, you tend to find your, your niche and your skills as time goes on. Sometimes proving people wrong is, is really not worth that. The time and energy that goes into pre, pe proving people wrong. Me personally, I let people make the mistake. Even I know if they make the mistakes, you let them make the mistake. The only way people learn through, um, people don't listen, right? So when people don't listen, you let them make the mistakes and you let them learn on their own. You can't correct people by showing them or making them see you know, a different point of view or your point of view because they're gonna think you're wrong anyway. So the time and energy you spend on that could be rather focused on your capability and your strength that you need. Have you ever thought about a business coach or a mentor, right, Ria? Um, I have, but I'm, a, I'm not a, the most pleasant person. <laughs> So, You're not the um, what? <laughs> Very difficult. You're not the most pleasant person. <laughs> yeah, so um, I had a mentor. Yeah. But um, I don't know if I couldn't keep up with him or he couldn't keep up with me. So things okay. kind of pipelines and the cracks. But mm -hmm. that's something I really, really, really want. And um, I don't know, you, you guys have probably picked it up in our conversations. Um, mm. I reached out to Ayanda, you know. Um, She's mm -hmm. the marketing manager for MTB Base, MTB. Mm -hmm. um, the work she does is exceptional. The way mm -hmm. she moves is amazing. Um, she's one of the greats. I really think she's going to be known. If you don't know her now, mm -hmm. I believe 100% you will hear about her. And she's not my mentor, but she's someone I look to when mm -hmm. if guidance. She's someone if it's not necessarily going to her table and be like, hey, and I look, um, I kind of, I look at the work that she's done and I look at how she did it. I, then I will go to her later and ask why she did it. But that's how I've learned to maneuver around things. Um, I find it very okay. hard, even though I speak a lot, mm -hmm. but it's, it's, I find it easier to keep to myself than to, and again, Spongile, you, you probably wouldn't know that how I behaved in Vega it wasn't a facade. It wasn't a shadow of anything. I was moving freely, but in me moving freely, I still cared. So I cared about how people see me and how people are interacting with my behavior, but I didn't care enough to change it for them. Mm. So um, it's just it's just one of those things. I don't know. It's I don't know how to explain yeah, it. No, no, no. Listen, you've explained yourself really well. Yeah. I think I think we are. You're a, you're a phenomenal person. I think you're underestimating your capabilities right now. And you have this thing in yourself right now that you keep on telling yourself all the time, right? Being free and being authentic is something where you find that niche skill in yourself. You find that voice, you find that passion and that drive to do something and to make that change and to make that difference. You know, I hear that you have a yonder that, you look up to in the sense of the work that she's doing you need a little bit something more than that though and you know i think you you'll find it you will mm -hmm. you will definitely find it sometimes it may not be the person in your industry it could be someone else that could help you and guide you in into a different path right um sometimes what we study is usually not what we end up doing what we're doing so okay so what what's any other challenges so I think the other two challenges kind of come together. It's um, being resilient and being consistent, you know? Mm -hmm. um, when people speak of millennials, they always speak about us um, giving up too easily. Yeah. Speaking about us um, abandoning missions. And I don't know, like the people around me, I've, I've honestly seen the people around me always having a follow through, right? It may not be an orthodox traditional follow through of, go to school, finish, get a job, get a wife, live a good life. Like they always go in whatever way they go. But at the end of the journey, what I've seen is that people come together and they say, yo, do you remember I told you five years ago, this is what I was going to do. Five years later, this is how they did it. And usually 
who would go through it the orthodox way. They've done it in a very unorthodox way. And I think my fear again is I know my journey and I'm experiencing my journey. You know, I'm very conscious. I'm very aware of how I'm growing in my industry and how um, I'm creating that sort of relevance within myself as a service provider, so to say. But I'm, I'm, I'm always afraid that, you know, it was mentioned that the world is changing and mm -hmm. if you with the world you kind of fall behind. And I think being a part of the world is being a part of the change, but sometimes mm -hmm. you don't it, and therefore you can't really contribute to it. And I think this goes again back to my first fear, but um, I just, I don't want to give up. And sometimes it, 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 it's easy to give up because they'll tell you that again, like for example, just the way I heard it is sometimes you don't do what you study. You know, and then for me, that's motivation for me to give up and follow something else. Whereas I'm here now, I've been doing this. This is what I want. I don't want to end, end up somewhere else. I don't want to do anything else. This is where I'm at now. And I want to be here now, but in the future, I want this now to be better. You know, so I think those are like, that's another fear that I have that I'm going to become a salesman and there's nothing wrong with being a salesman. It's just, I studied branding, you know? Okay. I don't have taken what I studied, what I learned, because I used to fight with my lecturers. I used to tell my lecturers that what they're saying is wrong. I, like I was yeah. that guy and I'm still that guy. And I don't want to have been that guy all my life just for my lecturer to see me in a sales position and being like, so you told me I was wrong just for you to have come and do this. I don't know, like it's, it's, it's a big fear. And again, I'm not trying to be rude. I'm not trying to be weird. If you're in sales, I think it's amazing. I just don't want that for myself. And listen, you don't have you don't want it for yourself, and you have the right not to want it for yourself, right? I I I get the sense you you're feeling afraid to speak. Is that why you challenge people? No, I don't. It's so weird. I don't think I challenge people. I think what I do yeah. is I, I want people to be their most honest self, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes when I speak to you, it's not that I'm challenging you. I just know that you probably said it because Pongile said it. So mm -hmm. I interrogate you more and I speak to you more. And, you know, in a more intimate environment, like yeah. I, can say, I was in Vega, I was like, I had, I had no friends, but I was everyone's friend, if that makes any sense. Like my only yeah. friend was yeah. honestly. At the time, Rudolf, me and you, now you know what it is. <laughs> but like <laughs> at the time, like I had no friends, but I could move around so many environments and speak to so many people. And I think that's a gift that I have, honestly. And you realize when you're speaking to um, Pierre, right? When you're speaking to Pierre um, in front of an audience of people, his answer is not going to be the same as when it's an intimate conversation, when it's just the two of you guys. And you know what, bro, like, honestly and you're like no man but you know how people are you know how and then that's where you get the truth and i'm not challenging anyone honestly it's just maybe my approach is wrong and i should fix my approach but i do feel like a lot of the times um people get swallowed in the right answer in the most diplomatic answer in the most correct answer that they forget to give their answer and their answer is what everyone else is thinking just no one really wants to say it out loud and and that's scary though right we shouldn't be we shouldn't be we shouldn't be what the majority or minority is saying is not necessarily what we believe and what we think and what we feel and what we think it should be you know we are having our own views and our own personal viewpoint on on these things right and it's very interesting that you're saying that because if one is saying yes and everyone follows and everyone follows and everyone says yes, and in actual fact, it's a no, no, we don't need to do that. Guys, we don't need to do what society is dictating that we need to do. We don't need to get married. We don't need to have children. We don't need to go and study. We don't need, if this is what you choose to do, it's different. It's a choice that you make. It's not, it shouldn't be dictated about what society is telling you to do. And that is, and, and that for me is the scary part. I learned it the hard way. I did. I did learn it the hard way, but I did learn it. It's, it's also about making sure that, you know, you know, you are heard. I think, I think we are people, people are not, not having healthy conversations. People, as soon as you say, no, I don't agree. People don't want to come up 
and have a healthy conversation and say, you know what, I, you know what, I don't disagree. I don't disagree with you, but here's my view. People are not willing to accept that. People feel that it's a target or it's a judgment or they think it's negative. And that for me is sad because that there would break a lot of barriers in society if we start doing that. Yeah. That's my personal view, right? If we start speaking up and if we start saying what we feel and other people not getting offended like, to what, what you were talking about, you know, um, the other guy, you know, if he said what he wanted to say and come into a more, you know, cozy conversation, then he said what he truly felt. What's the purpose? You're missing the point. Honestly. Right? He's missing the, is he's missing the point. That's, that's not the point, you know? And, 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 and if there's one thing, you know, I think, you know, you know, one of, one of Open Mic Foundation's missions is to be your authentic self. <laughs> it actually is to be. And for people to accept you for who you are, not judging you, not saying what society should be telling who you are, not none of those things, but for you to have a voice to speak and to say what you want to say. And, and it's very important. I think the youth today, is, is don't go with what society is telling you to say and how you should be saying it. Be able to speak up, say what you want to say. Doesn't matter if somebody disagrees with you or not, it's okay. And, and that for me, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's a challenge. It's definitely a challenge. But thank you so much, Rio, for that. I, I appreciate it. Thank Rudo, you. we're gonna, you. yeah, Rudo, up to, you're the last one. So you're gonna wrap us up. Yay. Um, my fear, I think, is definitely one that I share with a lot of females. It's, it's, it's being a, a, a woman in South Africa. Okay. It's, it's, I mean, we have one of the most highest femicide rates, gender-based violence. It's been in the news for how many years? It's like you being a female, you don't leave the house without some sort of, whether it's a protection prayer or it's a, it's a taser, it's a pepper spray, because you just never know if you're going to be the next hashtag. It's a constant fear because I never want to hear justice for Rudo, justice for Sibongile, justice for, for, for Jessica. You know what I mean? You never want to hear that. And it's constantly on the news. It's, even if it's not the highlight, you know that somebody today was, was taken advantage of, or you know that somebody passed on today based due to their partner. You know what I mean? And it's, it's mm -hmm. scary and it's a fear that, you know, I don't, I don't really have much control over. Yes, I can hashtag, I can retweet, I can go to the marches, I can ask my family members, I can lock my door, I can share um, my, 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 my location. 24 7 with my friends and my loved ones but it's something that it's a fear of of just the the, the south africa we live in and yeah i've done i've done all the the small things of sharing location and sharing my even to the extent of sharing my uber um screenshot on my phone about their number plate and their number everything but that fear never goes away because the people who cost on the people who were hurt they weren't you know they weren't naive that all oh, this is a red flag or they weren't they weren't careless with what i even read something the other day and it says um, it says that regardless of whether you're a good man or whether you need help or anything if he is walking three minutes behind me some sort of fear just arises in me. If I walk, if I come, if I go into a taxi and it's only men, I am mm -hmm. going to be the uncomfortable passenger. And I'm like, please protect me because it's just like that. South Africa today is, it's almost like you want to leave. Sometimes I'm like, you know what? When I have the amount of money, I will leave. It's that type of fear of, I don't want to raise my daughter here. I don't even want my sister to be here. What about my mom? What about my grand? And the, the other scary thing is that even with all of these things happening, some, some females are even in the act of the wrong. They will deceive you to, 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 to maybe be trafficked, for instance, to be kidnapped. Yeah. 
-hmm. And it affects, fear affects me to the point of I want to help people. I, if, mm -hmm. if there's a female by the, by the, by the highway and they, they need a ride, I want to help you. But there's, there's this fear in the back of my mind, like, you know what? Maybe not. Maybe the next person will help her. Maybe another man or, or something. That fear is constantly at the back of your mind of, you know what? Maybe don't help her. Or, or, or don't even look at him. Or you know what? Even if you're in a rush to get somewhere and the taxi's full of men, I will literally be like, oh, you know what? Sorry, wrong side of the taxi. And I will close the door because that fear is constantly at the back of your mind of what if. And it's just scary. So... Listen, there has been a lot of things that's been going on around the world right now. I don't only really think it's South Africa, okay? Yeah. I think South Africa's stats are higher compared to other countries, but I also don't want to dismiss it and say it's just South Africa, okay? Yeah. Um, what do you think should be some of the things that could help women in this situation? I have my own view. So what do you think? I'm going, I'm going to put something forward that I know not a lot of people would agree to. But I always okay. said it, it's just about consequence. I'm not saying that the death penalty should come into play, but I'm saying once there is a but once there is a strong consequence to 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 somebody's actions, they won't do it again. If you kill a female, then I'm not saying yeah, go die. But stronger, stronger sentences need to be put in place. Don't, and, mm -hmm. and the thing is, you will hear that, oh, I got taken advantage of, and these people get off on bail. But mm -hmm. when they got off on bail, whatever they, that happened to you, that doesn't come out of bail. It forever mm -hmm. in your memory, you already destroyed the person. You know what I mean? So for me, yeah. what I think can be done, forget the retweeting, forget the hashtags, forget the marches, let the government and the people who are in power need to create stronger consequences for certain actions. If it is sure. the death penalty, let us as let the team who would or the people who would handle the death penalty per se to mm -hmm. make to make not to say, okay, if you did that and you're a suspect, this is you. Let the investigations be deeper. Let 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 us uncover more to see what is more because there's so many rape cases that are being dismissed. Mm -hmm. There's so many so innovations things that have been so i hear you right so so i hear you consequences is one thing we can't influence that as much as we think we can okay so i'm gonna pose yeah. something to you guys what do you think we can do to make a difference i have i have i'm very strong in this and i believe i'm going to do this and i'm saying to you and i'm telling you now i'm going to do this um Myself being part of domestic violence myself, okay? I can tell you this much. If there's one thing I've learned, and, and, and Open Mic Foundation will be doing this in the next year or so, is to actually have women protect themselves. Stand up, fight, right? You don't have to be a victim. You can stand up and you can fight for yourself. Mm. And what I plan to do is to give them the tools and to teach them how to fight for themselves, okay? You don't have to be subjective and to be a number onto that street. You have the willpower and the fight to fight them back. It doesn't matter what situation it is. So I believe as much as you, I agree with you, Rudo, in the sense that, you know, consequences, sure, but we can't control that. My view is how do we change society in what we can control? What difference can we do to make a difference to not be in that situation? We can't change people's behavior. We can't change people, what they do, how they do, why they do what they do, because it's who they are. But what mm. we can do is control who we are and make sure that we can stand and we can defend ourselves when we are in that situation. Yeah, it's actually, it's actually surprising that you say that because one of my life goals before I die um, is um, to have a shelter for women. I want to have a shelter, not, not even... I don't even want to just say women because I do believe that certain cases are, are, are started at a young age. There's something that is that they see or something that happens that triggers something inside. So I want to say I want to show to, to help people mm -hmm. one day. One day when I'm able to, when I have the money and, and the contact and everything, 
I want to have a shelter where it does not even take people from the street and keep them safe, but also help people to deal with the inside and to mm. also protect the people around them to have that thing as yes. well. So yeah, absolutely I do agree that it's something that we yes. can do as women, as men, even like yes, we say femicide, femicide, you know, the majority mm -hmm. of the victims are females, but the men as well forget that they have so much working to do. Even if you're you're not the type of guy to hurt a female, they also need to be so outspoken about it, more outspoken about it. If they know and they also need to reprimand their gen. Mm -hmm. They're, they're made of, dude, you know what? If she said it like that, it really means that, you know? Yeah. I don't think yeah. they stand up enough to their friends. The yeah. things that they share. I, it, it, yeah. You're, you're, you know, for me, influencing the, the attitude. Yeah. yeah. You know, the thing is that um, we have a lot of, we have a lot of women shelters out there. We have a lot of different programs that helps women. I've just not yeah. seen programs that helps women to defend themselves. True. Haven't haven't nothing i haven't seen i see your hands i haven't seen where i can teach you self-defense i can teach you how to do this i can teach you and listen i haven't seen it personally if you guys have i could be mistaken but i myself hasn't seen that right karen i totally agree that we do need to change the narrative because right now the narrative is that women are a little bit weak and you can beat mm -hmm. up on them you know, and if you just look at like a tiny little example, if you go to the gym and you see the bodybuilders, the female bodybuilders, the other guys look at them like, oh, but you're not all that. And there's always these derogatory, oh, but she's like a, a he, she or something. And it's just this whole thing. And I feel like as a boy mom, like when I found out I was having a boy, I was happy. I was like, okay, I don't have to worry about you getting raped. But then I realized there's a greater responsibility to teach him that, listen, oh. If a girl says no, it's no. You need to respect her the same way you would respect your friend Tom or Ben. Like we are all humans and that's how you need to see this person, you know? And mm -hmm. I think the violence against women, if he can respect women, he then re respects members of the LGBTQ community. It's so big. Like it's just, if we now say yeah. we can beat women, then what? We're going to kill LGBTQ members. Then we're going to kill this and that. It's just, it needs to stop and we need to change the narrative and educate people a lot more and strengthen the women like you say like I, I honestly haven't seen programs where women get stronger and we get so used to it like I don't we realize when I'm walking down the street I don't realize oh I'm gonna change lane I'm gonna have my key in my hand it's just it's so much a part of us that we don't realize this is a fear so until Rudo had said it I completely missed that actually I am afraid of being raped like I don't leave the house when it's dark because it's dangerous, but we, we've just normalized it and that needs to change. Mm -hmm. But I can, I can tell you this much, is when you go through a self-defense program and when you get that fear out of you and you can punch that bag as much as you can, you can ask, oh, I've punched a bag a few times. Uh, it's a different situation. You feel empowered. You feel that you wanna go out and you'll take your life back and you take yourself back from that. Priya, yourself, you were gonna mention something? Um, so I have a little sister, you know, and like, I get so worried for her, honestly. Um, and I'm just thinking to myself, like, okay, so my little sister goes to a self-defense class and she learns how to like whip ass, right? And now she's a badass, but then they're like five guys coming down the street. She's still not strong enough. And then they take her or like my, I just, I, I always get these fears and my little sister shouldn't be put in a position where she now has to uh, be making herself better so that she can defend herself against the guy. I feel like whenever people speak about this issue, they're always talking about, okay, women need to wear dress, yeah. women need to wear less, or you know, women need to stop going out later. I hate it, right? Yeah. And back in the day, that's, that's, that's exactly how I used to think, right? But like, I just think having a little sister just changes that a lot, right? Where women shouldn't be rehabilitated, men should. Men yes. should. Yes. The way they think That's men it. should change the way they interact with society like because we're doing so much to try to protect women that are still going to be attacked right so mm -hmm. look the wall now and the wall is, is is the difference between you being raped and you not being raped but that man is going to try to break through it because that man is sick men are sick right so what we need to do is yeah. firstly again as men we need to hold each other accountable and it's it's difficult because again i was having a conversation with my mates 
And the reality is, and I'm just trying to be as frank as possible, is when we're talking about girls, it's like, yo, hey, that hun is a flame. No, dog, she, she, you know, I don't know how to, right now, this is natural and this is still, yeah. My, yeah. but, you know, I shouldn't be saying that hun is a flame. I should be saying, you know, she's beautiful. And that rehabilitates me because now I'm not going to be sexualizing her in any way because for her to be mm -hmm. a flame, looking at her physical attributes. I'm not looking at her, what's inside her head. I'm not looking at what she's done. I'm just looking at physically what I think I could get from this relationship. And I think like once we start correcting that behavior in men, and this starts with our fathers, right? It starts with our father's fathers. Once we can correct this behavior and we can be like, okay, Oaks, um, this is how we have to go around things, you know, where we stop being a product of our father's traumas and we correct our own traumas, I think that's now when we when we go out to the world and I don't see you as a flame as a hun. I see you as a competent professional that I really want to get to know. Yeah, no, true, absolutely true. So to go back to your question about your little sister, right? You know, fighting or having to be able to protect yourself is not only physical, it's also mental. Okay, so I, I want you to 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 have that that clear understanding about what I'm saying. Physical is one thing to protect yourself, but it's that mental wellness, a well-being that one creates in their self in order to move forward from whatever it may be. So as much as as much as much as we say self-defense, self-defense is a little bit more than that. It's about courage, it's about mental stamina, it's about perseverance, it's about being resilient, it's about it's about much more than that. Hence why I'm saying, you know, Open Mic Foundation is definitely one of those, those reasons where I'm, I'm going to be putting a program together and initiating, you know, um, you know, women to come together and to be a part of this program, you know, and to encourage, you know, people, you know, to step up. You know, I, I'm going to post something, Ria, you touched on something very, very, um, very, very important. As much as we're saying, you know, the men needs to be rehabilitated, sure. I think I'm trying to find, and, and I'm going to post this to yourself and Jason, you don't have to answer me now. What are some of the things that we can do to rehabilitate them? Okay, you don't have to answer me now. It, it's a struggle. As much as, as much as we can say our fathers and, and Karen being a mom of a boy and myself being a mom of a boy, it also starts with the newer generation that's coming through as well. Okay. It also starts with the kids that are born right now so that they know as well, so that they understand and, and those mistakes to, and those uh, things don't get repeated again. Right. So we have two sides of the coin, but you also have that middle here is where it's festing as well, right? So, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pose that to you guys so that you guys can, you know, see. And, and if, if you find ways, if you find ideas, Open Mic is all for, for listening and, and to hearing what are some of the suggestions and ideas that you can have to do this and to find a way to reach out to people that, you know, the men that's, that's actually causing the harm that needs to. Karen, I see your hands up. Jason, I see you want to see, but Simon well, no, Gelli has no, no, like put a, a, a hand up there. Thing. A small response to your question. I think it relates back to Rudo her saying consequence. I think in some instances that is the be all and end all. I mean, I think a lot less men would be willing to take a risk to rape a woman if they knew that they were going to get put in the electric chair three weeks later. To be honest, I'm I'm of I'm, yeah I'm quite opinionated like that. If I think rape is something that should be punishable by death after a certain extent of trial. Mm. I understand that there are instances which are, I think, minuscule percentages where a rape has happened and it turns out to be a false accusation, etc. I I think that is few and far in between. I think of, and even from young, like where boys are pushing a girl <laughs> in the playground yeah. and it, oh, you know, they mean to girls that they like and the, the parents kind of condone it as, oh, it's cute, he likes it. <laughs> I, yeah, I think if a boy pushes a girl down thinking, oh, you know, he likes her, yo, you should get a, a hiding there, then. <laughs> you should know from when you're young. You should know. You don't, any form of physical, especially in the beginning, just physical abuse or physical confrontation, it's not cute and it shouldn't be condoned, like, at all. I I think by the time you my age, if, you, if you're still thinking, oh, I'm going to try and risk raping this girl, you know exactly what's cutting and you should just get put in the chair within a month of that because, yeah, there's no room for that now. There's enough men in South Africa to make this 
to fill the roles that need to be filled by men that we can afford to lose the ones that are of no value, which to me, I think if you're such a, if you're such a, a predator, I, I can't see if someone's engaged in rape or femicide, like, I mean, I see recent cases, I mean, and it's vicious. It's a sick form of yeah. it as, you know, guys cutting up women and putting them in bags. I think yeah. what? like a guy like that, put him in the chair. No one's gonna, no one's gonna regret when that guy's gone, you know, I, and that's- No one's I, gonna, no one's going to actually miss him and that's your point. No, not at all. Yeah, so that's just Simu how I'm gonna get it out before the, rest of the ladies speak. <laughs> Simu Gele. Oh, they so are so passionate. Um, yeah. okay, but basically, I just actually want to pose something to you guys, right? Because as much as femicide is such a huge deal, but now we could take it from a domestic violence situation. Mm -hmm. With the women that are in these relationships, but they can't get out. And it's because they don't necessarily want to, whether it means, whether it's in the case of they actually feel like they can save the guy or maybe whatever reason they have, but how do we then convince these women about the self-defense classes or about psych psychiatric um, therapy or whatever it may be? Like, how do we remove people stuff, like struggling in that environment and, and pretty much help them? And how you know? I don't know if that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. You, know, you know, I think if you can't help someone who doesn't want to be helped, it's very difficult to help somebody who doesn't want to be helped. It's very difficult to show somebody a problem when they don't find it as a problem. Yeah. The minute it's an internal thing, it's like a, it's like a psychological thing. When you don't see something as a problem, yeah. you're gonna be like, "But yeah. why? Why do you want me to come exactly. with you? They're not gonna come with you." And I think you know what. It, there's a fine line of ish, and I hate to say this, but sometimes uh, they have to see it as a problem. Even, you can't kidnap them away from their dangerous situation for them to see it, because even if you take them, what are you going to do mm. with them when they don't even see that it's a problem? You know, it's something that you have to, it has to be in mentally and inside and be like, you know what? I don't want to leave my kids. I don't want yeah. to live this dream house or, but. I have to go and that has to be a decision that happens internally yeah. and that's when you're looking for help then we help yeah. you yeah but if you don't see so, that it's yeah so so Rudo is spot on on that right because you can't help people that don't want to be helped you mm -hmm. can't force them to do it i think what is important though is when women don't accept these things and don't see it it's about also validating themselves first because it does start with themselves. It does start with for them to accept themselves mm -hmm. first before they can actually help themselves. Because remember, they don't feel worthy, right? They're in a position where they don't feel worthy. They don't know how to help themselves. They have kids. They, feel, they don't feel. Now, one thing that I can tell you, um, Simon Gile, is that when women know that these type of programs are out there, and they see the cases coming through and they see what the result of those cases are, that's mm. when we start empowering people. Mm. We start okay, inspiring that's... them when you have other women doing what they're supposed to be doing. And when the story reaches the people, you'll see that they will connect more with it. That's what actually happens. And that's why you need a program to be seen and to be heard in all the communities to be reached out there so that they can step forward and be part of something greater than what they are. And you'll see the numbers coming. So you'll see the people, they don't have the strength right now. They don't, mm -hmm. but they will find the strength. They will. But to Rudolph's point, you can't force them. Rio, you wanted to say something? Oh, sorry. I just wanted to, basically you touched on honesty and I think you said it better than I would have. But um. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to the whole thing of self-narrative, you know, just yeah. in an education system that on a very positive self-narrative that um, exposes the realities that are going on in the world. Yeah. Just making sure, like reinforcing the message of, you know what, like, a man is not the protagonist and the woman is, I mean, is the antagonist. Like you are the protagonist of your own life as a man or as a female, you know, and yeah. I'm just thinking of it from the whole perspective of, like so this guy you know he's the breadwinner at home um she has absolutely nothing 
the children are being beaten, she's being raped, even though she's the wife, you know, because, you know, you have to give consent and all of that. She, she still stays because, you know, there's a, there's a amount of comfortability she's been um, given in this whole situation. But I think when you take self-narrative more seriously, you realize that, look, tomorrow is tough, but the day after tomorrow gets a little bit better, you know, even if you only have as much as you had the next day. So I just yes. think it's little things. And, and again, it's, it's very easy to say when you're coming from privilege, because I'm very privileged, you know, like I have a bed, um, I have Wi-Fi after this conversation, I'm, I'm sorted. Someone else doesn't have what I have. So they're going to be like, yo, dude, I hear you, but no. But I think, you know, we just have to create an environment and it's up to us as well, because we're responsible in as much as we're not, in as much as we're not the ones who, 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 who are implementing the evil out there. We also just turn a blind eye, you know? Mm. So people who can't take care of themselves, we have to create an environment where we start proposing ideas or we initiate things where they can be taken care of. And again, it's mm. very difficult to find people who care because I'll give the example of McDonald's. Um, most McDonald's that I've been to, as you drive out, right, there are all these homeless people who are asking for food or who are asking yeah. for money. Ninety percent of the time, I leave. I, I don't, I don't chill and like at least here's some fries, here's a coke. I always leave. And you know, there's a variety of reasons why, but I'm just trying to create an example where I explain like there are times where we can help and we honestly choose not to. Mm. No, true, true. Very interesting. Um, you <laughs> mentioned, you know. You'll be, you'll be very interesting to know, um, Ria. Majority of domestic violence, as much as it's reported, it's, it's more in the, you know, in the um, un, um, informal settlement. Can I share something with you? It's actually in the privileged areas more. That was actually what I wanted to say. Yeah. Like, I feel this yeah. narrative of the woman being weak is not mm -hmm. what happens in domestic violence. And we said, and I think yeah. you had said this session when we were um, talking about the talk that we've just, we've made this world where women can be whatever they want, but we haven't mm -hmm. prepared men to handle these independent women. Yeah. And a lot of the women yeah. that I know who are being beaten yeah. up and who are going through this are women who are making more money than their husbands and are doing great, you know? And you get up in the morning, you put your makeup on, you get to work and you keep quiet because it's embarrassing. You can't yeah. be a CEO and you're being beaten up at home by your husband who's just like, who earns five times less than you. You know, like that's, that's not something yeah. you want the world to know, unfortunately. And yeah. That's the thing. Yeah. And, and I feel like no matter what the consequence is, if it's that little mental aspect, that man doesn't see it in that moment that, oh my gosh, I might die. He's going to do it anyway. Mm -hmm. He does not yeah. see that I might go to jail. I might be in an electric chair. He is still going to beat you because it is completely yeah. in his head and psychological now. Yeah. Mm. It's actually the privileged people that's the one that's experiencing more of the domestic violence. It's just that you don't hear of it as much as you would hear uh, in, in, you know, in the informal settlements and, and places like that, you know. Um, you'll be amazed um, as to some of the cases that, that comes through and some of the, the things that you hear. Um, being, I have a very diverse set of friends and if you hear some of the stories and in August we have Women Month and I'm actually going to be sharing a story from, a personal story for myself and I'm going to be the first one to admit to a lot of things as well because society has put that stigma over us. It has definitely has put a stigma over it definitely but we also must be able to talk about it and be able to be free to express it as well but it's it's a lot of you, you know a lot of privileged women that do go through it it's just not known as much as we would want it to be known again to Karen's point as well is they don't want to guys it has been an amazing talk it is now 10 to 5. We've been almost two hours. Oh, hey? Wow. Hey? It is going to be upset. No, no, no. Listen, it is. it has been a phenomenal talk. A phenomenal talk, you know. I, I couldn't have... Hey? Can I just ask for something while we're wrapping up? Um, sure. I have an idea, and I don't know who is listening and who is even able to help me with this idea. But open mic is a place for opportunities. So here I go. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking of, you know, just, I don't know how to do it. I don't know 
you know, where to, where to even start, but really putting self-defense as one of the modules that children go through in PE. I really, really think that from the get-go, from the ground, from, from, grade, from grade three, that it, 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 it started in PE, that in order to take it very seriously, and I, and I, and I don't even want to say only females must go through no. that in LO, PE, sure. but everybody, I think from a young age, needs to start, and, and I think adding this module of self-defense in PE or even if it's an LO to do a mental self-defense and then the physical can be in PE to really roll it out. I don't know how to do that. I don't know how I'm gonna even start doing that due to contact. But if you have advice, please let me know. <laughs> so, you know what? So, so you know Andy and Adal, the Fighting Fit Academy, right? So Fighting Fit Academy is a South African kickboxing um, they are two South African um, kickboxing champions, black belt champions, and they have been rolling out self-defense in some of the schools, okay? Um, the challenge that they, but it's private schools, the challenge that they're facing is that they can't get into the government schools, right? Wow. Because of the policies and because of the red tape, okay? There's a, I think it's about three or four schools that they started the modules at, and to your point, they, they have been trying to get into, I think, they need help. And I mean, Open Mic has pledged to actually help them to roll out programs to communities. So Simbangele, Karen, I mean, if you guys, I mean, if you guys want to be part of this, you know, we can definitely, you know, have those programs rolled out. It's about getting the funding to help, you know, these programs get lifted off the ground and just see, you know, how we can, you know, get this, you know, done. So maybe we can take this offline. And if Simbangele, you wanted to say something? Oh, I just was gonna support Rudo and be like if she ever needs or if you need help with eventually building up the proposal you know getting for example what you said in terms of fundraising and stuff like that I'm more than willing to do that because it's something that needs to be a bright light needs to be uh, shone over this whole thing and in mm -hmm. terms of uh, feminism and basically giving people the gift of realizing that they are who they are for a reason. Nobody else can ever take that away from them in any physical manner. You can't beat it out of you. Nobody can tell you that you're worthless. Nobody can show you that you're any different than the person you are just because they say so. So if there's any uh, mental rehab, 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 rehabilitation, that word, okay? <laughs> so if there's any way <laughs> we can help, um basically bring that to the forefront i'm more than willing because okay guys I talk about this all the time okay i think we have a project on our hands how's that right let's 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 collaborate let's have a project let's get going and let's see what we can do to change things right i mean we're on level three and i'm sure things are i mean we're getting some some hearts and some love here um so hopefully you know if people are willing to to partner up with us and get on board, let's see what, how we can structure this program, let's see who we can get on board, let's see who are some of the brands that can come in and align with us to see how we can uplift this, this um, thing. Because guys, it, these things, you know, we have to, in order for us to instill change in whatever we want to do, it starts with us, right? Mm -hmm. we, can't, we can't change policies, we can't change government, we can't change procedures, we can't change the red tape. It is what it is. But if we can start with ourselves and make that smallest, slightest little change in this world, it has to be us that makes it. No one else is going to do it. No one else is going to do it. All right. So, guys, thank you so much for taking the time on a Sunday afternoon. Ria, I know you were at work. I'm so sorry. I hope you had something to eat. You know, I thank you guys so much for joining. I appreciate your time. Um, we seem to have more kitchen talks coming up. There's been a lot of talk about people wanting to come to the kitchen. So we're going to definitely be having more talks coming through um, with some different youth that's coming to, to kitchen talk. So thank you guys so much. I appreciate it. We're definitely going to be again. <laughs> thank you so much and have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Don't forget to follow our social media platforms, Instagram, YouTube, Please follow us. Please like, share, and comment. And continue to join us every Sunday, please. Thank you guys so much. <laughs>
<laughs> Thanks, Trudeau. <laughs> <laughs>